wish to follow along in your Bible, our reading comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. Beginning with verse 12 and reading through to the end of the chapter. First Thessalonians 5, verse 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with all men. See to it that no one repays one another with evil for evil. But always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. Verse 16, rejoice always. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Verse 18, in everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the, the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and he also who will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Well, this evening, as you by this time, I think, have undoubtedly grasped, I want to direct your attention to verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, when you think about it, in some ways, that's a remarkable commandment because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world with horrors, atrocities, viciousness, cruelties, murders, adulteries, thefts, robberies, and the list is without number. We live in that kind of a world. We live in a world where loved ones are sometimes killed in accidents or die early in life with some fatal disease or in other ways are tragically impacted and we're still under this commandment to give thanks in everything. Now notice the interesting and I think uh, compelling declaration in the second half of the verse. The first part is a commandment, in everything give thanks. That's a command. But the second half is a declaration about God's thinking on the subject of giving thanks. It is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now if he said it's just God's will for you, that in itself is compelling. But when he puts it, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, he's saying this is high profile. This is important. This is part of our relationship with Jesus Christ. This is part of our walk with him. That in Christ, one of the manifestations of the lordship of his son as our redeemer is that he desires us to be a thankful people. So it's close to God's heart. And if you are one who desires to please your heavenly father, here is a wonderful door of opportunity to focus on something that is 
in some measure doable. It, in one sense, it may sound very simple. In everything, give thanks. Just four words. But in fact, it can be a profound reflection of our understanding of God's sovereignty. So I want to start by addressing some definitions so we have some, please God, some agreement on what we're talking about. The word thanks, and thanksgiving is a fairly common word, but what does it mean? Well, Webster, in his 1828 dictionary, says it means to express gratitude for a favor. That's one definition. To express, or we could say communicate, appreciation or gratitude for a favor. Second definition. To make acknowledgment to one for kindness received or to make acknowledgment to more than one for kindness received, to make acknowledgment. So notice both of those definitions involve saying something. Now Webster says that gratitude is the feeling or sentiment excited by kindness. Does our heart appreciate and respond being the recipient of something kind? Does that matter? And if it does, that's a blessing. And I think it's not improper to point out that right now in our country, we are a people who far more focus on our expectations of what is owed us, the entitlement attitude, as opposed to the giving of humble thanks, recognizing in truth that the only thing we actually deserve under the justice of God is all the miseries and pains of possible in this life, the agony of death itself and an eternity and the torments of hell. That's what we deserve. So everything else is of grace. So this is really a very serious issue. So thanksgiving, the giving of thanks, is the verbal expression of that sentiment of gratitude. Gratitude is the awareness of good received. Giving of thanks is the expression of that gratitude. So I think that's fairly straightforward. I don't think that's particularly difficult, except to concentrate on the fact that with thanksgiving, there must be a recognition that there's at least two parties one party that extends a favor, and the other party that in some way that's appropriate acknowledges that favor, that grace, that kindness. So to be a giver of thanks who seriously wants to please God in that grace, the implication is profound that there's got to be some recognition of a relationship between us and the Lord in Christ Jesus. And that's how we, of course, give, are to give thanks. We are to grow in gratitude, but if we don't understand that there's a relationship with God, that's not going to happen. Because it's a grace, first of all, between us and our Heavenly Father, and our Heavenly Father blessing us in such a way that we recognize it and give Him thanks. The response in a blessed relationship. Now, there's a heavy duty issue in this that Paul, albeit briefly, expresses powerfully in Romans 1, if you care to turn there. In Romans chapter 1. In Romans 1, Paul has this to say. Beginning with verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, 
for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Verse 21. This is a one that's a candidate for underlining. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him, two key words, as God, or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Bad theology produces a bad response. Understanding Christ as the one who reveals to us God the Father, and understanding through Christ God the Father is the very cornerstone of God-blessed, spirit-blessed theology, the study of the person of God and the work of God. They knew him as God, but didn't worship him as God. The Bible is very clear that God is to be worshiped according to scripture and with an understanding of forming our thoughts according to the word and not according to the imagination of our heart. So when our theology of God, in other words, our understanding of God is not from scripture, in other words, bad theology, the doctrine of God, it's going to have an absolutely irresistible effect, of which we may argue is the preeminent one, that of the loss of the grace of thankfulness and the development of a thankless heart. The seemingly small and maybe in the minds of many issue of being thankful is not a simple byproduct of the past. It's a real issue nowadays. I find that more and more parents are struggling to develop in their children a keen sense of well-grounded scriptural thankfulness, first to God and then to others, both vertically and horizontally. We are to be a thankful people. Thankfulness or the lack thereof reveals the quotient of pride in our heart. Proud hearts are not thankful hearts. Proud people do not habitually give Christ-centered, Christ-enabled thanks. The absence of thanksgiving reveals our heart theology in great measure. Do we understand ourselves as utterly dependent upon God for everything? <clears throat> Paul said to the Athenians, as recorded in the book of Acts, speaking to that cluster of arrogant philosophers, that in God we live and move and have our being. Every breath we draw is an occasion of God's enabling sustaining grace to each of us, even unbelievers. And when God withdraws that breath, of course, we die. The issue of thankfulness is not something that's just an issue within the church. The society at large has some awareness of the importance of giving thanks. And Shakespeare has a remarkable quote. I think it's an insight that's interesting. I don't know that we have any sufficient evidence to hope that Shakespeare was saved, but he certainly had a good understanding of many aspects of human behavior and thinking. And he made this comment, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. How sharper than a serpent's tooth to have a thankless child. For those of you that are parents, is it true or not 
that one of the simple graces that we seek to have develop in our children is the grace of saying upon the reception of some favor, thank you. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Aunt Susie, or whoever it is that extends that. To not just grab something with a thanklessness that reflects a spirit of self-awareness, selfishness, and self-centeredness. Would you turn to James chapter 1? In James 1, we have a text that puts us in the accountability of either implying this or not in our practical expression of our theology. Verse 17 of James 1. Every good thing bestowed, every good thing bestowed. The clothes we wear, the house we live in, our friends, our circumstances, the ability to get an education, the pleasures of reading and other things that God allows us to do. The list is endless. Every good thing bestowed, which implies a source and a recipient, and every perfect gift. So he's really driving that nail home that everything that's good is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Now, it's easy to say when something pleasant occurs, especially some surprise favor that we hadn't anticipated, we can rejoice. But tonight I'm asking you to consider, can you say this about a tragedy in your life or a tragedy in someone else's life? Can you say this in truth? Because we live in a fallen world, we all experience trials, and Jesus Christ was explicit about that at the beginning of his public ministry. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you <clears throat> and say all that kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad. Some translate that exceedingly glad. For your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let me ask you, when you meet a bit of flack from friends, loved ones, associates, fellow workers, fellow students, because of your testimony of Christ, perhaps ridicule, perhaps a sneering remark, or something like that, is your heart at the place that you want to rejoice and you are concerned to rejoice like the apostles in Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost? They counted it a great honor to suffer persecution for the name and person of Jesus Christ. But there's more. If we're going to take on board this Christian duty, there's a yet weightier passage. And I have confidence most of you know it. Romans 8. We know Verse 20, 28, we know, not saying we suspect, we hope, or we concede grudgingly. No, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, and to those who give, who are called according to his purpose. Now, a quick aside that when people just say God causes all things to work together for good and they leave out the conditions or qualifications, 
that's sin. Because that is not a general promise to humanity at large. That is for the elect. That is for those whom God has called out of darkness into the light of the gospel. But for those who by God's grace have been given the gift and the immeasurable favor of saving faith, that's an immutable declaration. All things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So that means I have a duty as well as a privilege, as do you, to apply the principle of God's benign sovereignty to his covenant children when they're faced with a tragedy or a difficulty. I will confess to you that one of the most vivid moments of my life was when I was in the accident in 2009 when this huge pickup four-door pickup crashed into my small Volvo and compressed the car up to the windshield and I was badly injured. But my first thought was, I've been hit. So that came under the, the heading of mastery of the obvious. It didn't take a lot of intellectual effort to, to decide that. But the next thought in my heart was, I think, inappropriate and yet an evidence of how weak our thinking is because there was a presbytery meeting that was imminent and I knew it was going to be difficult. And my second thought was, thank you, Lord, I don't have to go to presbytery <laughs> as they rush me to the hospital. Kind of sorry, sad, but that's the truth. That was the second thought. And then as I was being taken to the hospital and considerable discomfort. I thank God that he began to roll through my thoughts this text from Romans 8.28. Can I find in it something that God has for me for good? And the first thought that I had, and I think was true enough, as I've tended to be through the years a very intense person in terms of getting things done, and trying to get a gallon's worth of work and a quart's worth of time. And that God said, Robert, I'm slowing you down. And I think there were many other insights. But I clearly needed that. And I thank God that he gave me the grace in spite of my feebleness of love and service to at least be given the grace to implement an application within moments of a most unpleasant experience. So humility is essential, starting with the recognition of the source of all good, including trial, persecution, pain, and suffering. A proud heart cannot give thanks. The Pharisee in Christ's parable of the two men praying spoke, it says in the text in Luke, to himself. He prayed to himself. Lord, I thank you that I am not as other men are. I'm not as bad as that tax collector, that sinner. That's not the thanksgiving that we're considering here. Thanksgiving related to God's providence in our life God's government in our life pushes the issue back still further to the foundation. Do you believe that God is sovereign in everything? Do you believe there is nothing that's out from under his sovereign lordship and rulership and kingship? Do you believe what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6? that we're bought with a price, speaking to Christians, we're not our own, that we are to glorify God in our body. And that's a declaration of kingly ownership. In a democracy, we've had a long history of developing the gospel according 
to saint independence in which we teach our children, and I've heard countless Christian parents say this, well, I'm teaching my son or my daughter to be independent. Nowhere in scripture can you find that instruction to parents. We are to teach our children to be interdependent and not foolishly and selfishly, parasitically dependent, but nowhere are we to teach our children to be independent. So if I'm going to be given the grace to thank God as he calls me to in everything. An indispensable element is recognizing my low estate to the place where I'm even given the grace to confess it. So if you will, look again at Romans 8:28 for a moment. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good, and that would be his good on his terms, to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. One of those conditions has to do with God's sovereign decision before eternity began in our election. But the second is very much one that's an opportunity to us to examine our hearts. <clears throat> do I love God? And then it follows beautifully back. Do I love God enough to acknowledge without mental reservation that all things are working together for my good as part of his sovereign lordship of my life. Would you turn, please, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. would help if I turn to Philippians instead of Ephesians. Philippians 4, verse 4. Text many have memorized, and that's a good text to do so. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I have a question for you. Do you think your heart and mind need guarding? Or do you think you have matured enough in the Lord, your heart and your mind does not need to be guarded? Anybody willing to raise their hand and say, I don't need to be guarded? Beware, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we all need our mind guarded, our heart guarded. The seat of our thinking, the seat of our thinking, the root of our thinking, the foundation of our thought life and our emotions and what makes up our personality and all that goes together in us as an individual needs guarding. And I don't believe any one of us in this room has arrived at such a level of maturity that there's no need to be guarded by the spirit and word of God in their heart. We all need guarding. And look what he says is God's means of grace, his means of guarding our hearts. Rejoicing. Letting our patient, humble spirit be known to all men. Praying to avoid the sin of anxiety but with a thanksgiving heart, bring all our supplications and petitions to God. But notice there, with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is to be a constant element in our prayer life, corporately, individually, in our families. And if we pray 
with a forbearing spirit, consciously seeking to overcome the ever-present temptation to be fearful, that's what anxiety or anxiousness is, God says that if we pray in that manner, making our requests known to him, the peace of God, and that's the peace that comes, of course, when we know our sins are forgiven, which surpasses all comprehension. In a lifetime, we cannot understand its full depth and breadth and height. That shall guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So, you want to have a guarded heart and a mind? Give thanks. Give thanks, give thanks in everything. That's something that can be learned. And if you think about it, beloved, it's a simple command. It's not something that requires great forethought and struggle to implement. We can learn to say, thank you, Lord, in every circumstance. Now, we don't thank God for murders or robberies and so on, but we can thank God for starters for his providential hindrance of the full expression of evil in the race of men, that God providentially hinders a great portion of the wickedness of unsaved people is well taught in scripture. So we can start with that. And we can give thanks in trials and persecutions and so on. We can give thanks for God's protecting, sustaining, enabling us to deal with it in a humble way. We can give thanks for that. We can give thanks for his protecting and preserving us in the midst of trials or even persecutions. And we can rejoice that our hearts and minds, in spite of us, are guarded by the Spirit of God. Have you ever given thanks to God for guarding your mind and guarding your heart? If you have, I praise God. But I suspect many of us take a long time to get to that place where we actually are able in some sense to see that giving of thanks is an instrumental part of God's sovereign care of his sheep. Giving thanks. It's a response. It's a response of being alive in Christ when we have a heart to give thanks to God in everything. And then if you look back for a minute again at verse 7, to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, I want to be so bold as to say that includes mental health. That includes uh, having a sound mind. When we are guarded by the Spirit of God, Thank you, Lord, for helping me remember not to sneeze into the microphone. Beloved, rejoicing is an inseparable part of thanksgiving. And the guarding of our hearts and minds by God's own involvement in our life in Christ Jesus is part of the treasure that we inherit as believers. That's part of our growing in and part of the kingdom. Notice again in Romans 8, the wording. It's crucial in taking this seriously. Romans 8, oops, hear me. Corinthians is not Romans. Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. We know that he causes all things to work together for good. God's direct fatherly hand in the grace of Christ is at work in our lives 
protecting, sustaining, governing, and shielding and shepherding us. Now in our commandment, in everything gives thanks. Notice that he said in and not for. Paul did not say give thanks for everything. We're not to give thanks for what is evil, but to give thanks in everything, which is in every circumstance in which we're exposed. And then I want to take one other, take you to one other text to suggest a key element in the theology of thanksgiving. Will you turn to Luke 12, please? Luke chapter 12. Verse 47. Now this is the end of a parable about slaves being faithful and watching for the master's property when the master is away. In verse 47, Christ then gives application. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will shall receive many lashes, severe punishment who knew his master's will. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. And from everyone who has been given much shall much be required. And to whom they have entrusted much of him they will ask all the more. Can you see an application for us? The Reformed churches, we've been blessed with the grace of many forebearers, beginning with the Reformers and the Puritans, who developed sound theology. We've been given the grace to understand the marvelous ruling and overruling of God's sovereignty in our lives and many other insights that are far from trivial but comfort to our heart. As those who have received much in the way of truth, the expectation to love that truth is much greater than for those who've been given little truth. And in churches where the whole counsel of God is preached faithfully, the expectation of God that they respond appropriately to that richness of endowment and that outpouring of favor is clear and reasonable. Even unbelieved unbelievers and those who are strangers to the gospel recognize that to whom men entrust much of him they will ask all the more. And we're seeing that politically over and over again amongst people who, many of whom are strangers to Christ. So a few thoughts by way of application. First, simple observation. Grumpy people are almost never thanksgiving people. Grumpy people don't give thanks. They complain. And do you have a tendency or a temptation to be grumpy. If you do, that's more than just a little off on the side sin that needs to be tweaked. That's a serious hindrance to embracing the holy grace of giving thanks to God. I submit that unthankfulness, an ungrateful heart, is a key element in losing mental alertness, losing the element of joy, losing the element of happiness, losing the element of clear thinking. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be satisfied. And if you see a person who is unhappy, a complainer, the sour spirit, you know that there's a person who has never understood the lovely abundance of a thankful heart well expressed more and more often. Thanksgiving should be proportional. 
The more we grow, the more we should seek to give thanks in everything. So taking the initiative to give thanks is a mark of spiritual maturity. Please turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. Verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Not just give thanks, but be thankful. In other words, we're to strive to so embrace the grace of thanksgiving that it becomes part of our essence, part of our character, part of our very being. That the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So our worship is to be infused with a spirit of thankfulness. That's beautiful, isn't it? You think about it? To become more and more focused on Christ so that every interaction with our Heavenly Father and His Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, is infused and saturated with a thankful spirit and thankful communication. Verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Three verses, three mentions of that common grace of the giving of thanks. So what's your example that you set before others? Are you one who's jealous to express thanks? I believe that we are so naturally unthankful and so naturally self-centered that it's a learned grace. A learned grace. And now here's an aside for parents. Over the years, I've encountered parents who said, well, if you teach children to say thank you when they're not really thankful, isn't that hypocritical? And the answer is absolutely not. Every grace is unnatural. And we cannot separate in some discerning way what's going on in a child's heart from when a particular expression of good becomes natural to that child through God's grace. We teach our children to say thank you because that's an essential part of relationship development. We teach our children, if we're Christians, to say thank you because that's crucial for preparing their hearts to have a rich relationship with Jesus Christ and through him with our Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ himself gave thanks. He did it regularly. He gave thanks when God enabled him to perform a miracle of feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000. He gave thanks before he called Lazarus from the tomb, as recorded in John 11. And everything give thanks. He gave thanks to God for an experience that was a heartbreaker for Mary and Martha. They both said, Lord, if you had just come here earlier, our brother would not have died. And Christ gave thanks for the sovereignty of God in establishing that monumental milestone in the public ministry of Jesus Christ to prepare those who are truly called out of darkness into the light of the gospel to appreciate and the better understand our glorious Messiah. So are we to give thanks in everything? Absolutely. Second Timothy. Some helpful insight. 
2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Verse 3. Suffer hardship with me is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Do you think Paul suffered many difficulties and imprisonments and stonings and shipwrecks and so on? Records this for that for us in 2 Corinthians. You want to know in some measure the maturity of your walk with Christ? Ask the Spirit to show you the measure of thankfulness that he has implanted in your heart and mind. Amen.